So we're continuing our sermon series that we're doing on the book of 1 Corinthians. Last week we were up to 1 Corinthians 6 and we looked at what Paul had to say about lawsuits amongst believers and also about sexual immorality. Uh, this morning we're up to 1 Corinthians chapter 7 as Paul gives uh, some very um, challenging instructions on marriage. But before we get into 1 Corinthians chapter 7, I just want to... Um, <clears throat> I want, I want to share with you a little bit about a, uh, what a wedding looked like in Paul's day since we're talking about marriage. Incidentally, how many of you uh, were married in the church or have been married in the church? All right. Um, let me know if any of this sounds familiar because I'm going to share with you what, um, what a pagan wedding looked like in Rome uh, in Paul's day, okay? All right. So when a couple decided to, that they were going to get married, um, a ring was placed and it was placed on the third finger. And it was placed on the third finger because the Romans thought that there was a nerve that ran from that finger all the way to the heart. So when it came time to the ceremony then, um, the bride was dressed in white. She wore a veil, and she was accompanied by a bridesmaid. The wedding was typically held at the home of the bride's father, and something had to take place to make it legal. You had to have witnesses. So typically there was 10 or so witnesses um, in the father's house that then would make the, um, the wedding legal. The bride and the groom would stand before the altar and hold hands before the priest. And then the bride would once again consent to be given in marriage to her what would then be husband. After the words of consent were done, it was time to give a sacrifice to Jupiter. And that sacrifice was uh, usually consisted of something having to do with flour, a cake. And after Jupiter was offered his sacrifice of cake, guess who would eat it? The bride and groom. And after the bride and groom ate their cake that was sacrificed to Jupiter, they would then have a dinner immediately following. And after the dinner party, the bride then was escorted to from the father's house to then the husband's house. And this was you know, a very important part of, uh, of the ceremony, could not be skipped. And um, anyone who could join in on this procession of, of going from uh, the, the father's house to the, uh, to the, the husband's house. Um, and there was this kind of um, ritual that took place during this procession from the father's house to the husband's house. Um, there was a pretend show of force as the, the husband then would take the daughter away from the mother that would hold on to her. And as they were processing in great festival to uh, the, the house of the, uh, of the groom, they would toss upon the wed couple. They didn't have, rice wasn't imported back then. Nuts! <laughs> Gotta be happy that things switched to rice, but nuts were thrown upon them. There's something that could be said about that. And then before entering the new home, uh, the bride uh, once more had to uh, recite her chant of, uh, of consent to be married. And then the bride was picked up and carried over the threshold by her husband. Then the doors were closed to the general public, but the invited guests were allowed to come into the house where on the procession to the house was carried a torch. And upon entering the house, the, 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 the bride and the invited guests, the bride would take the torch and would light the fire in the house. She would extinguish the torch and toss the torch for then the invited guests to scramble for someone to get the, the torch that has been tossed. How many of you are feeling good about your church wedding? So it, it goes to show you that 
in the Roman uh, Catholics were, were the best at this. They would come in and they would take existing pagan things and they would baptize it. They would say a blessing over it and they would make it religious and holy. They did this with, uh, with, with wedding, which is basically a, a pagan ritual that the church adopted. Um, and honestly, it was done with uh, Christmas and Easter, which were pagan holidays, which then were inserted Christian ones in its place. And they, they would do that time and time and time again. Now, if you did not like what I just told you there, that will pale in comparison to Paul's words. I was just tenderizing you for what he's about to say. So, when we get to 1 Corinthians 7, Paul's, Paul's addressing and answering some questions that the Corinthians uh, had asked him in terms of marriage. Uh, remember, the Corinthians were pretty immoral people. Most of them probably did not even mess with uh, this concept of marriage. And if they did, they were kind of curious in terms of what God's expectations were going to be in terms of if they were co- going to be married and, 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 and what that looked like. And so uh, Paul takes then uh, what is in 1 Corinthians 7, 40 verses, and he's answering, uh, answering their questions. Now here's the deal. In the same way that in today's society and culture, our, our wedding ceremony is pretty identical to the pagan wedding ceremony. The reality is, is our culture is very similar to the culture of what it was in Corinth. And we have uh, so many of the same issues that uh, affect marriage in our day and age, as certainly was the case in um, in Paul's day and age. And here's the deal. Um, I- I'm convinced of this, that for, for most people who talk about Christianity and for most pastors who stand up and preach on Sundays and always give these feel-good messages, they, they don't preach the Bible chapter by chapter and verse by verse because one thing that is clear is when you choose to preach the Bible verse by verse and chapter by chapter, um, it's not necessarily good for church growth. There's a lot of difficult stuff that you have to deal with. In fact, the majority of it seems to be at times difficult and and the amount of just feel good and happiness uh, is certainly um, not as frequent uh, but certainly is uh, obviously more important because we're we're forgiven uh, in spite of our sins through the blood of Jesus. But here's the deal. I was kind of curious. I'm like, how in the world do I preach 1 Corinthians 7 in, in, in a culture that we live in today without just having people want to, uh, you know, kick me on the way out or something like that? So I decided to, uh, to see how some other people preached it by watching some sermons on, 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 um, online. I couldn't find a lot of sermons on 1 Corinthians 7, and I, I thought I found one that was really going to be good and, and, and hopeful and so forth. And he watered down everything in it that was so difficult so that he wouldn't have to squirm when he was up there talking that I just kind of turned it off and said, well, here we go. So here's the deal. Um, I'm not here to beat up anyone for their past, but so oftentimes our past keep us from talking about what God's word is and applying it to our lives. Our past is our past, but our present and our future is our present and our future. So uh, I'm more concerned about the decisions all of us make today and tomorrow, not the decisions we've made in the past. And here's the other thing. When we're afraid to talk about uncomfortable things because it makes us feel bad about our past, we deprive our children of the knowledge of what God's word really says. I'm just not going to do that, okay? So for our kids in here, for those who are not married, Paul's got some really important stuff that you need to hear that um, you might struggle with a little bit in today's society. Now, as I share with you from 1 Corinthians 7, I'm going to do it out of the ESV. Normally, I do it from the NIV. I like the NIV because it's a pretty good translation, but it also flows nicely. It makes sense in how it reads. The ESV is very... um, is more accurate to what the Greek actually says, but because of that, sometimes it doesn't flow as nicely when we read it. It's not as easily uh, understandable. But I'm here to tell you that the ESV does a a better job at translating what Paul says. It's more uh, more correct to the original Greek than what the NIV is. So we're going to look at 1 Corinthians 7 based upon um, the ESV translation. So 1 Corinthians chapter 7, Paul talks about if you've got uh, NIV, he's, it, it says he's talking about marriage, but it's really, marriage is just a small piece of what Paul's talking about here because he says in 1 Corinthians 7, 1, what he really says is he says, now concerning the matters in which you wrote, that is, concerning the questions that you wrote and asked about marriage, he said, it is good 
for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. That's just, don't expect that. Why does Paul say this? And once again, the NIV talks about it in terms of marriage, but it's broader than marriage. Paul's saying it because he, he's talking to a group of people that are in a very immoral society, okay? Um, everything is, is, is sexual in that culture. It's not much different than ours. We drive down the freeway and there's the Budweiser girls, right? All the commercials we see on TV, all the advertising, we get it. We're not a whole lot different than, than Corinth. And so um, Paul's also a believer of the time is short before Christ returns. Everyone has always said the time is short. Turn on the radio now, the TV, or the radio. Turn on the radio, the TV. Turn on the radio, the radio preachers. Turn on the TV, the TV preachers. Everyone's screaming and shouting, it's coming and it's coming soon. And everyone's always thought it's coming soon. The problem is Jesus said no one knows the day or the hour, but to be ready. So to be ready, I guess you always have to think it's coming soon. So Paul believes, he truly believes the end's coming soon. So he would much rather have the people of Corinth focus on the things of heaven than the things of the flesh if indeed Christ is coming soon. He also knows that he's dealing with a bunch of immoral people, and, uh, and so he knows that it may not be real realistic that they don't engage in, in, in the pleasures of the flesh. So he then goes on and gives them this encouragement in uh, chapter 7, verse 2. He says, But because of the temptation of sexual immorality, therefore each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. In other words, Paul says, the time is short. You really shouldn't be engaged in this stuff at all. Have your heart and mind focused on the things that are above. But I know as you look around you, the temptations are too great. And for most of you, you're way too weak. Therefore, go ahead, get married. A man to a woman, a woman to a man. But then he says, if you do that, you have some responsibility. Maybe some of your uh, spouses have used this passage on you, especially maybe the guys using it on the wives, but chances are they didn't know this was in the Bible, so I'll just apologize ahead of time that now they will. 1 Corinthians 7, 3 to 5. The husband, if you're going to be married, should give to his wife her conjugal rights, and likewise the wife to the husband. For the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. That Paul, he can be so sexist sometimes, can he? Oh, wait, wait. He says, likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Or he's being equally that way. Then, so he's not being bad that time. Do not deprive one another, except perhaps by agreement for a limited time, that you may devote yourselves to prayer, but then come together again so that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Paul says, I prefer you remain single, but you're in a very immoral society, so get married. But since you are in an immoral society, because there's airbrushed Budweiser girls everywhere down the street as you're carting down the street, right? He says, in the relationship of the two, guys don't withhold yourself from your wife, wife don't withhold yourself from your husband's. This is certainly a good application to modern marriages today because, you see, we not only are in a very immoral society like Corinth, but in addition to the, the immorality that's all around us, um, there's, a, there's just the busyness of life, right? And with the busyness of, uh, of life, um, uh, that part of a relationship can break down. Um, because we're constantly looking at airbrushed magazines of what you know people should look like sculpted guys with you know uh, you know ripped muscles and and perfectly airbrushed women who who r remotely don't look like that it changes in our mind on what we think people should look like and it messes with our mind it gives us all self negative images of ourselves in which maybe we're not even comfortable uh, being that way with our spouse because we don't feel good about ourselves. And in the end, what it does is it gives Satan a foothold, especially in a very immoral society such as ours, as it was in Corinth. Um, Paul speaks about, God speaks about um, the two becoming one. And when the two become one, you no longer have sole right to yourself, but the two of you are one, and you make those decisions together. All right, Paul then goes on and, and talks about um, 
the gift of celibacy. Now, this is kind of interesting. Um, for the life of me, I, I constantly hear people that talk about the fact that Paul was married. But when you read Scripture, nowhere does Paul speak about being married. There will be something in 1 Corinthians 9 coming up in which he speaks in the, in the, uh, in the plural. He speaks as like a group and, and, and says something about marriage. So people are like, aha. But no, I mean, sometimes we just do that as, as a form of speech because if you speak in the singular, it sounds like you're pointing fingers and people don't like that, right? But uh, some, people, uh, some people claim that, that Paul was, was married earlier in life but became a widow. Others say that maybe he got married uh, later in life. Some people say, well, he was a, a member of the, uh, of the Sanhedrin, therefore he would have had to have been married. Uh, the scriptures say that Paul was a Pharisee. It does not say that he was a member of the Sanhedrin. He was certainly on that path uh, to become one. But... Um, but Jesus intervened, and, uh, and he, uh, he left his former way of life behind. In fact, we see here in 1 Corinthians 7 that Paul touts the fact that he does have the gift of, of being celibate, of not needing to uh, be in a relationship with a spouse. Look at 1 Corinthians 7, 6 to 7. He says, Now as a concession and not a command, I say this, I wish all of you were as I myself am, but each has his own gift from God, one of one kind and one of another. So Paul has the gift of celibacy. Paul has one who uh, wants to focus on the things that are above rather than the things of the flesh. But he recognizes that though he has that gift, not everyone has that gift. He encourages those that has that gift that they would live according to that gift. But if not, then he says it's perfectly fine to um, to Mary. So then Paul goes on then starting in verse 8 and 9 and he kind of gives instructions to kind of different groups of people in society. In verse 8 and 9 of 1 Corinthians 7, Paul is giving instructions to the unmarried and to the widows, okay? And so Paul says basically uh, to the unmarried and to the widows. And when I say the unmarried, I'm talking about those who, um, who have not married uh, as of yet. And so uh, if you have not married at this point in your life, as Paul's writing this, or if uh, you were married but uh, your spouse died, he encourages that group of people to, to stay unmarried. It's better to stay unmarried. The time is short. It's better to focus on things that are above. But he says to that group of people, the people who have not been married, and to the people who have been widowed, but if you cannot control yourself, if that's not your gift, uh, if you need to be in relationship with another person, then go ahead, it's okay, you can be uh, married again. Uh, then Paul then goes on and talks to the people who are married. And Paul is speaking to the people of married that are married. He says that um, you are to uh, stay married. Um, in, in fact, if you choose not to uh, heed the advice of staying married, Paul then says you should stay uh, then single the rest of your life. And so when we get into this topic, that is such a difficult thing because of where society is today in this country and certainly would have been a very difficult thing for the people of Corinth too. And because it's a difficult thing, we just don't talk about it and we especially don't talk about it in the church. But you know, when I was thinking about this and thinking about the whole concept of divorce, I just very much remember in my mind there was a time in which it was hard to get a divorce and then there was a time in which it became easy. And so I did a little research on, on history of divorce, at least in America, and, uh, and found some interesting stuff out that I want to share with you this morning. And um, uh, an, an apology to all my Reaganites in here, and, and hey, I like Reagan. I got a picture of him in the office. But it actually st started with him as governor of California. Um, so prior to the 19... Uh, 70s or so, uh, you, you had to have cause for marriage, or cause for marriage. You had to have cause for divorce. It was legally binding. You couldn't get out of it except for, for cause. And so um, Ronald Reagan, when he was married uh, to his first wife um, in the late 40s, she sought a divorce from him, and she had to come up with cause to be able to divorce Reagan. And um, the cause that she used was mental cruelty um, to divorce Reagan. Uh, 
Reagan certainly did not like that experience in his life, uh, and certainly from his perspective, this was just something that his wife made up in order to get out of this relationship with him. And so when he became governor, he had this, uh, he had this desire so that people would not have to make up things about other people in order to get a divorce so that they wouldn't drag people's names through the mud just because they wanted out of the marriage. And so he signed into an act in 1969 as the governor of California, um, an act that allowed people to have no cause divorce. Um, and he did that for good reasons, but he ended go, uh, later on in his life saying that he actually um, um, Politically speaking, that was one of the things that he really regrets having done because of the implications it had on society. Well, marriage was no longer legally binding. And think about it. If your cell phone contract's not legally binding, of course, there's always amount of money you can pay to get out of it. But in business, if your contracts aren't legally binding, what good are they? Well, the same thing's true with marriage. If you don't need cause to get out of marriage, it's not legally binding anymore. Therefore, what happened in the 1950s, before this act was signed, the divorce rate was around 20%. Um, by the 1970s, once people could get out of marriage without cause, divorce rate jumped to um, just over 50%. And so on a society, what it did is it changed our understanding from marriage being what God had set it out to be, to being something in which um, if it didn't work out, you can get out of. And it, it's changed the psyche of marriage so that we're not nearly as particular about who we get married to because we know we can always get out of it. Um, I was around a conversation with, uh, with two ladies, one uh, 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 an older teenager and the other uh, in, in, in her uh, early 20s. And one of them was speaking about uh, people that she knew that has, have chosen not to be married um, or for whatever reason aren't married um, and how neat she thought that would be uh, to, to do that because of what they're able to commit and do in terms of serving to God and, and not have to split and divide their time up. And that, that might be a route for her. She really thinks that's a cool thing. The, the other uh, girl said, oh, no, not me. I, I'm, I'm definitely going to, I'm, I'm definitely getting married and, you know, and what it does is with marriage, we don't worry about it before we get into it. We don't struggle to make sure that we find just the right person. It's just about getting married. And that's not how marriage is according to the Bible. It's just how it's developed within society and it's kind of been in society throughout the ages. Um, Paul then goes on and he speaks to those who, um, who are married to unbelievers. And uh, he has some words of advice for them. Now, when people, if some of you in here have been married to unbelievers, uh, you know that that can be kind of difficult. When you're um, falling in love with someone and you're just like obsessed with how cute they look, um, how nice they treat you and all these different things, uh, most of these other things don't mer matter. But when you marry someone that doesn't believe as you do, um, over time that's going to create struggles. Now that's the case in, in our lives, but in Paul's life, as the Corinthians are asking questions, it's a whole different set of problems because what happens is none of the Corinthians were believers. And then Paul comes to the Corinthians and shares them about God and Jesus Christ and all these teachings that are a part of the uh, Judeo-Christian faith, right? And so at that point, some of them are choosing to believe and some of them are not. Certain husbands are like, I'm going to be a believer, and the wives are, I'm not going to follow that. Certain wives are going to be, I'm a believer, and husbands are like, I don't know what that guy Paul's saying, but I'm not going to go along with that. And so they're asking Paul, what do we do with spouses that aren't going to go along with what their other believing spouse believes? Paul answers this question in 1 Corinthians 7, 12 to 16. He says, if any brother has a wife who is an unbeliever, and if she consents to live with him, he should not divorce her. And if any woman has a husband who is an unbeliever and he consents to live with her, she should not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband is made holy because of his wife and the unbelieving wife is made holy because of her believing husband. Otherwise, the children would be unclean. But as it is, they are holy. But if the unbelieving partner separates, let it be so. In such cases, the brother or the sister is not enslaved. God has called you to peace. For how do you know, wife, whether you will save your husband?' 
And how do you know, husband, whether you'll save your wife? So Paul says, and specifically this is speaking to uh, people who didn't know this getting into it because they were both unbelievers. Paul says, if you just can't live with this unbelieving person because of the conflict that it's causing in your family, then you can go ahead and be separated. But how do you know that by you staying with them that ultimately they won't come to faith? And, and, and I would say the same is true for us today, especially for those of us who enter into marriages knowing that the other person isn't a believer. Um, you cannot discount by the fact of through your influence, through the word of God being spoken in that house and the children being raised um, in faith, that indeed your spouse might not become a believer. So we're running short on time. I only really took you through verse 16. There's uh, like 40 verses. The next 23 verses just really expound on what Paul has said already. Um, But let me just kind of summarize and wrap it up this way. Um, Paul's not against marriage, um, but with marriage comes a great amount of responsibility. You gotta be very careful before you enter into it. And once again, at this point, I'm really just trying to speak to those who who are unmarried and to um, any of our youth or kids that might be in here today. Um, So oftentimes people will choose to get married um, for the wrong reasons. And as a pastor, I see that a lot. Sometimes, sometimes we choose to get married because, well, we don't really like being alone. In fact, we're afraid of growing old alone. And for those of you who aren't married, I'm telling you that's, that's not a reason to just hurry up and rush and find someone to get married. It, it doesn't work out real well if that's why you're getting married. A lot of people get married because they can't afford life. It's expensive to pay for that apartment or to pay for that house. And because it costs so much, they'll go and want to get married because now they can afford those things that they want out of life. It's not the reason to get married. Sometimes people get married and want to get married because they want to get out from the thumb of mom and dad. And I'm here to tell you that that is not a reason to get married. Marriage is a wonderful thing, but so is being single. But one thing that marriage has um, is a is a set of difficulties and of complications when the two try to become one. And you see that as you get two different peoples with two different parenting styles having to come to an understanding of how you're going to parent the kids. You see that struggle in marriages. And as a pastor, I see this stuff all the time. When husbands, you can never live up to those romance novels your wives are reading. And wives, you can't ever live up to those airbrushed pictures that your uh, husbands are noticing in uh, Sports Illustrated. Um, Marriage is difficult when you find out when you've married someone that that person's lazy. Marriage is difficult when you've married someone and you find out they're not good at managing money and they're making your life very difficult because they can't manage money. Marriage becomes very difficult when you got married thinking that person was going to solve all your problems when in fact they have not. Whether you're single or whether you're married, one thing's clear from Paul. God is still supposed to be the number one priority in your life. And to the unmarried, I just say this. Um, What I've shared with you today is so foreign to today's understanding of what marriage is. But if you are unmarried and you want to get married and you choose to get married, I encourage you this. Understand what you're getting yourself into in terms of what Paul says that commitment between husband and wife should be in 1 Corinthians 7. And secondly, and equally as most important, find someone else who embraces that same view. Would you join me in a word of prayer? Gracious Almighty God, as we hear these words today, many of us might be wrestling with guilt. We feel from uh, mistakes we've made in the past. We are sorry, gracious God, that we are polluted by society. But we thank and praise you, gracious God, that the blood of Jesus covers all. We pray, gracious God, for those of us who have trouble forgiving ourselves for the, for the wrong decisions we've made in the past, the things that we did not know that we should have known. We just uh, pray, gracious God, that you'd remove that guilt from us. 
um, and help us to focus not on the, the guilt of our past, but the choices of the present and the, um, the decisions of the future. And I lift up to you, gracious God, every, every child, every youth, every unmarried person in here this morning. May by your spirit, uh, these words that are so difficult to understand in today's society guide their and govern their decisions, um, whether they choose to stay, stay single or choose to get married. For your word is good, it is given to guide our lives and to make them simpler and easier. Your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. In Jesus' name, amen. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen. A few announcements before.